So, good afternoon. And today I'm going to do a kind of book report. Something I don't think I've done since I was a kid in school. <coughs> so the book is this one. It's called Rebirth in Early Buddhism and Current Research. And the author is Bhikkhu Analayo, who's a, a monk scholar from Germany originally. Uh, he's a monk in the Theravada tradition, and he seems to be quite a scholar as well. He got his PhD thesis, uh, as, his, as his thesis, he, he did a thesis on the Satipatthana Sutra. <clears throat> and some time ago I heard he was actually working as a professor in a German university, but it seems, according to the book jacket, it says he's now residing at the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts, and spends most of his time in silent meditation retreat. So that means he's not just a scholar, but he's also a meditator. So this book was just published this year in April, and um, I heard about it just a month or so ago. And as soon as I heard about it, I ordered a copy. So the reason I'm interested in this topic is because as a teacher, especially when teaching um, introductory level courses, I encounter people who are skeptical about rebirth, and that probably happens here in the Abbey as well. <clears throat> and it's understandable, um, because it's something difficult to prove or disprove. Uh, it's a very important part of our tradition, for example, in the Lam Rim. I mean, if you take out rebirth, then you take out a whole lot of teachings. But it seems that in other traditions, for example, in Zen, at least some Zen traditions and Theravada traditions, it, it's not always emphasized so much, and in fact, it's not, sometimes it's not talked about at all. <laughs> so, and I've heard recently, in, in, you know, nowadays, there's something called secular Buddhism. People who are very attracted to Buddhism, Buddhist teachings, but have difficulty with the more supernatural aspects of Buddhism, like rebirth and other realms and so forth. So I think it's fine to be skeptical, because the Buddha himself said, you know, we shouldn't just blindly believe what he taught, but we need to think about it and check it out for ourselves. <clears throat> but some people go beyond just skepticism about rebirth, and they actually make certain claims, for example, <clears throat> Some people who say, oh, the Buddha didn't teach rebirth. Or they say, oh, yeah, he did talk about it, but it's only because this is what people believed in at that time, and so he was just sort of catering to their beliefs, but he didn't really believe it himself. <laughs> and, or they say that rebirth isn't to be taken literally, but it should be taken metaphorically, you know, like in each moment there's death and rebirth. Everything is dying and being reborn each moment. Um, <clears throat> so I'm kind of a little bit dismayed by these ideas that people come up with. And so I was interested to see what this uh, you know, monk scholar uh, from the West has to say. And apparently he specializes in early Buddhist uh, scriptures. <clears throat> okay, so just, I'll just to briefly cover some of the main points in the book. So there's four main parts. In the first part, he's looking at the early Buddhist scriptures. And he shows that indeed the doctrine of rebirth is there. Buddha definitely did teach rebirth. For example, the teaching on the 12 links, right? <laughs> I mean, that's an indispensable part of Buddhist teachings. You create the causes in one life and you re reap the results in another life. Also, the whole teachings on karma. And another case in the early scriptures is when the Buddha described his own experiences on the night when he attained enlightenment or awakening. <clears throat> he says that, you know, he recalled many, many, many lifetimes, you know, and he could remember where he was born and what he did and so on and so forth. Then he also could see the deaths and rebirths of other beings. Okay, so this was his direct experience of seeing rebirth, and this kind of ability 
comes about due to cultivating deep states of concentration. So anybody can replicate those experiences. You don't even have to be enlightened. <laughs> Just on the basis of concentration, you can remember these. And he says, um, in other sutras, Buddha mentioned that the denial of rebirth is actually a wrong view. It's a nihilistic view to say that everything dissolves, everything disappears at the time of death. This is a wrong view. So again, it's clear that he, you know, didn't didn't buy that. <laughs> that, that was wrong. <coughs> so um, the conclusion of you know looking at the early scriptures of the Buddha. He says, um, the doctrine of rebirth is an integral and essential component of early Buddhist thought and cannot be reduced to a taking over of popular notions from the ancient Indian background. Tradition considers rebirth and its working mechanics to have been verified by the Buddha himself on the night of his awakening. Rebirth is also intrinsically intertwined with the different levels of awakening recognized in early Buddhist thought. So this is something he also mentioned. There are these four stages on the way to arhat, the stream enter, once returner, non-returner, and arhat. And these are all correlated with rebirth. A stream enter uh, is someone who has, at the most, seven more rebirths before they attain awakening or, or nirvana. A once returner, only one more rebirth in the desire realm. <laughs> The rest of the time they'll be born in the form in the formless realms. And then a non-returner, no more rebirths in the desire realm, but we'll be in. So again, you know, it's all about rebirth. Rebirth is very much a part of that um, explanation. So anyway, those who say Buddha didn't teach rebirth or he only taught it to go along with what people believed in at that time, they got it wrong. This, these, there's no basis for those views. The second part of the book, he goes into debates about rebirth, which took place at the time of the Buddha and from then up until now. So it was a hot topic. <laughs> it was a very controversial topic at the time of the Buddha, just as it is now. And, um, and again, this shows that it's, um, it's not the case that the Buddha only spoke about rebirth to cater to his audience, because not everybody believed in it at that time. And it's also not like the Buddha to just go along with what people believed in. He didn't do that with regard to an Atman, a soul. Yeah? And he didn't do that with a caste system. He definitely debunked that. And animal sacrifice. So Buddha didn't, you know, he didn't just go along with what people believed in. <laughs> okay. And then the third part of the book, um, there's four parts altogether. The third part goes into current research, contemporary research, into things like near-death experiences. There's lots of those. And these are very difficult to believe on the basis of the materialistic view that the mind is nothing more than a product of the brain. <clears throat> and he also goes into cases of people, especially children, who talk about past lives and says that such material is considered evidence that is supportive of rebirth. It's difficult to prove one way or the other, but at least it supports the idea of rebirth. And um, some children also have birthmarks that correspond to their past life experiences. For example, um, he mentions the case of a couple of children who um, in their previous life were killed by being shot through the head. And in this lifetime, they, have, they actually have marks at the place where the bullet entered and then exited their head. So there's a number of cases of, of that, uh, birthmarks. And then the fourth and last part of the book goes into a case study of xenoglossy. I'm not sure how to say that. But this is the ability to communicate in a language that one has not learned in the present life. And it's interesting, just before I left Israel in June, I heard of a case of this in Israel. It was on the news. This little boy who was born in a Druze family. Druze are Arabic people, ethnically Arabic, but they are not Muslim. They have their own religion. And actually, their religion does include re um, rebirth, cases of rebirth. 
So this little boy, even though his family, everyone in his family and his community spoke only Arabic, when he started speaking, he spoke English. And language experts um, identified his accent as South London, <laughs> South London accent. And they were just baffled. Everybody was baffled. How did this kid learn English if everybody around him spoke Arabic? And um, anyway, so in this book, he tells the story of this man named Damaruan. Um, who he actually knows uh, personally. This man was born in 1968 in Sri Lanka. And starting at the age of two, he would sit down in meditation posture and start to recite in a language that nobody understood. The people around him didn't understand. But after a couple of years, somebody identified that it was Pali, Pali language. And... Um, and he would recite these long, 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 long texts and passages. His parents didn't know Pali, and there was nobody else around that he could have learned Pali from, <laughs> much less these texts that he was reciting. Um, they were Buddhist sutras. And also, the way that he did recite was very different than the way Pali texts were recited by monks in Sri Lanka. They, they normally recite very, very fast and in a very non-melodic way, just, you know, in a monotone. And the way he recited was slow and very melodious. And he remembered a previous life when he was a monk in India, and he first lived at Nalanda Monastery, and he became a disciple of Buddha Gosha. Buddha Gosha was a, one of the great masters. You may have heard of the Visuddhi Magga. It's, it's a text on, called The Path of Purification on Meditation. It's used very much in the Theravada tradition. So this is the 5th century. 5th century. <laughs> so this monk, or this little child, remembered being a disciple of Buddha Gosha. And uh, he was trained in learning, memorizing, and reciting texts. And that was that's that he he assisted Buddha Gosha because Buddha Gosha uh, was translating text from I don't know one language into another. Um, so anyway, in this fourth part of the book, Bhikkhu Analayo goes into great detail, <laughs> very scholarly, kind of lost me, analyzing the Pali text because the father of this little boy uh, made recordings of of his chanting, and in fact. If we have time, I can play just a few minutes of it because he has it on, um, they have it on the Wisdom website. Not long ago, I was in Bodh Gaya, and this, this sounds so similar to the way of chanting you, you hear in India. Anyway, this is actually the very first sutra, the, the first turning of the Wheel of Dharma sutra, the Dharma Chakra. Yeah, so he, he just recited it by heart from the age of two. Quite extraordinary. <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, Bhikkhu Analayo, as I say, went into great scholarly detail analyzing this, this, uh, these texts that this little boy was reciting, and says, in sum, the evidence surveyed above suggests that Dhamma Ruan's chanting of these texts as a child is a genuine case of xenoglossy in the sense of involving a recitation of material in Pali that he did not learn and was not made to recite in this way in his present life in Sri Lanka. So, again, this is just material that can point to, but not fully prove uh, without any doubt, the existence of, of rebirth or reincarnation. And... Um, 
at the end of the book, Bhikkhu Anilayu says, you know, it's the only way we can be actually certain about what does or doesn't happen after death is when it happens to us. We come to the end of our life. <laughs> Um, and he says, in the final count, it seems to me that what remains of central importance is to learn to face mortality, one's own and that of others, rather than turning a blind eye to it. I doubt this challenge can be met by resorting to arguments and counterarguments in the debate on rebirth. Instead, it requires diligent practice of mindfulness of death by way of giving full recognition to the indubitable fact of mortality. In fact, in early Buddhist thought, the deathless can be realized while one is still alive. It is not a state or condition reached only after one has passed away. So the deathless means the, the state of nirvana. So I think in the end, you know, the important thing is how we live our life now, moment by moment. But I think, to me, it's still important to think about, well, What's going to happen when this life does end? Because if, if there's nothing, <laughs> you know, if our mind just goes out like a candle when all the, the candle flame, when all the wax has been finished, then I, wouldn't have, I don't think I would have as much enthusiasm, as much energy to work on attaining higher states of mind. I mean, I just, you know, try to be a good person, try to avoid doing anything I'd feel bad about when I'm on my deathbed. But, you know, to reach these higher states of mind that are explained in the Buddhist text, you know, you need to believe in something more than just this lifetime. So for me, it's important, but I can understand that for some people, it may not be an important topic. And the most, but nevertheless, the most important thing is trying to be a good and kind and positive person in this life as much as possible. <laughs>